Hello and welcome to the Nature Unplugged podcast where we are all about inspiring wellness in the digital age. Let's get going. Welcome to the Nature Unplugged podcast with me, your host, Sebastian Slovan, and with me is co-host Sonia Mohammed. Hey, everybody. What's happening? Okay, I'm excited for this podcast. Me too. What episode is this? Mm, 59, I believe. Okay, <laughs> this we're going to do a book review. This is a little bit different. We're going to do a book review on a book we recently read called 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now. Okay, you ready for it? So, you know... I'd be curious to hear, what's your stance on social media? Do you love it? Do you hate it? Or uh, are you somewhere in between? And for most of us, our relationship with social media is quite complicated. Um, As I mentioned, we recently read 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now by Jerome Lanier. And this book was really informative and inspiring to us. And we're excited to share our thoughts and takeaways with you all. But before we get going, uh, a few updates, shall we? Let's. Okay. Well, this is this is not necessarily a nature unplugged update, but a personal update that we wanted to share. We just recently got back from a wonderful vacation in North Carolina. Um, we were, uh, it was awesome. You know, mm-hmm. even though it wasn't, a, we weren't working necessarily. We did have some awesome nature time. We got to we got to spend a lot of time in the Appalachian Mountains, uh, Boone near Boone, uh, North Carolina, the like a western, far western part of North Carolina. And I must say, um, I'm pretty biased as a Southern Californian that this is the best spot, but it was pretty epic. There was, it was like rainforesty, totally different, obviously different climate, cool animals, saw all sorts of cool things. Swimming holes. Swimming holes. Yeah, it was different. Waterfalls. Yeah, it was really cool. Um, So refreshed after time spent swimming in the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. Mm-hmm. It was beautiful. Uh, so that's a personal update. And then we have a we have a bigger update. Sonia, take it away. Bigger update. What yes, is it? Yes, we are excited to announce our upcoming event, the E! New Challenge, Hike to be Rad, which will take place over the month of October for the full month. We've joined forces with To Be Rad, which is a local nonprofit to raise awareness around the physical and mental health benefits of time spent in nature. And so over the month of October, we're going to be hiking for wellness in the digital age. And the great news is, even if you're not here in San Diego, you can join us from wherever you are. Um, So across the country, across the world, it doesn't matter. We hope you join us. You can hike with us, though, if you're local in San Diego. We'll be doing some weekend hikes that are free for folks to join. And our goal really is to raise funds to provide scholarships for individuals and families to participate in our outdoor programs to explore, grow, and challenge themselves in nature with guidance and support. Uh, Registration begins September 1st. And for more info, you can visit us at www.natureunplugged.com. And you can go to our events page. And that's where the info about this hikeathon will be. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh... We're gonna get. We're, you're gonna hear much more about this this hikeathon, but uh, we're pumped to get it out there. Going in, yeah, beginning of September, but the whole month of October, as Sonia said, this is really cool. Okay, shall we get into it? Yes. Let's get into it. So I want to start out with just kind of talking about who the author is. Mm-hmm. Jerome, Jerome Lanier. Jaron. Jaron. Yeah, his name Jaron. is a little hard to pronounce. So Jaron us Lanier. We're getting it wrong. So. Okay, here's the overview. He is a why you know why should we care what this person thinks? Mm-hmm. Um, and it turns out he is a, a computer scientist, musician, and writer. Um, he's kind of an OG Silicon Valley engineer, computer scientist guy. I, apparently, he was the one of the kind of co-creators of or the early creators of virtual reality. I just read or learned that he coined the term virtual reality. I don't know what. what? Yeah. Um, he was named one of the 25 most influential people in 2018 by Wired Magazine. He's he's the real deal in terms of uh, from I think he's sharing his thoughts on social media from a computer scientist lens, and that's something that mm-hmm. we're fairly hip to this stuff. But he's much more hip to this stuff. 
Yes, the, just a smidge. The technical aspects of what's going on sort of uh, with the algorithm and with uh, the big social media companies. So it was a fascinating book. Mm -hmm. Okay, overview of the book. Yeah. So, you know, the book, um, we have it here. Boom. Mm -hmm. 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now. And the title is a pretty accurate description. It's basically... Uh, again, a computer scientist's take on the disturbing impact of social media on our, on our on our personal lives and on us as a society. I think um, you know we're going to go through kind of an outline of like what the different arguments are and share our biggest takeaways. But it was really eye opening for us, and I think. I want to just mention that before you get kind of freaked out by the title, like this is all or nothing. I think the it is a pretty you know direct call to action to delete your all your social media accounts right now. But I think once you get into the book, you realize that it's it's not necessarily about um, kind of fully abandoning it. It's it's you know doing what works for you, and it may be you know I, you know I think about this like a uh, you know a book or something about like. I don't know, being a vegetarian or being, it does, doesn't mean that maybe you are fully become vegan, but maybe you're more mindful of, you know, the impact of, you know, eating red meat every day and that kind of thing. Sure. And I think the idea is that you're not necessarily going to become a vegetarian for life, right? The, right? the point is you play with it a bit, see what it's like to not have some of your social media accounts um, and just be a little more curious about that and aware. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Okay. So Let's start with a book. Let's start with the book outline here. Okay. And I think we'll, let's freestyle on this a little bit. Sure. We'll kind of, um, I really like the intro. Actually, there's a little cat. Can you see this? Yeah, I was sort of confused by why there was a cat on the cover until I read the intro. There's a cat on the cover and the intro is be a cat, not a dog. So you want to chat about your thoughts on yeah, you really like cats, so I figured. You yeah, this is fun it. because I'm more of a cat person than a dog person, and most of the people I've ever met tend to be more dog people. But um, I like cats because they are difficult to predict. Uh, you know, one day they're in a really cuddly mood, and they love you, and they love their life, and then you know the next day they're under the bed and or you know, missing completely and you can't find them. Um, they're curious, you know, they're not blindly obedient. Um, you know, a lot of the things that make us love dogs, and I do like dogs, are sort of the loyalty, the the consistency, the unconditional sort of obedience, potentially it depends on your dog and your training skills. But the, the premise of this intro is um, the author's call to be a little bit more like a cat when it comes to our social media. And I suppose life in general, it seems sort of philosophical of, you know, be curious, uh, don't follow authorities blindly or, you know, new platforms blindly, et cetera. Um, think about their purpose um, and your experience using them and what you're getting from it. Um, and your potential involvement in a larger system of like, what is that platform getting from you potentially? So it's the lens in which he asks you to sort of experience the rest of the book. And uh, I found it sort of a clever, funny way to get you in the frame uh, for the for the 10 arguments he proposes. Right. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm, and I'm totally a dog person. So I was a little bit offended by this <laughs> or sort of uh, put on guard right away. But I think I think when it comes for me, my preference as a pet, I want a dog as a pet versus a cat that like, I don't know what's going on. Or <laughs> I don't trust them. I don't trust cats. Don't know what they're going to do. Uh, but a dog, you know, it's like, it's fairly straightforward. But I think when it comes to m me living my life and the way I want to be, uh, I did, yeah, as you said, I don't want to be sort of a, a dog in the sense of blindly following orders, uh, but more kind of um, independent individualized like a cat. Shall we talk about the arguments? Yeah, let's jump into the arguments. Let's jump into the arguments. Okay. So this is the arguments are basically the chapters of the book. And again, we're going to share these, the arguments with you. Uh, you know, we don't want to, we're going to give you kind of an overview here. We don't want to fully spoil the book, but we're, I think, going to spend more time afterward on our biggest takeaways um, and kind of go from there. So argument one, you are losing your free will. This is a big one for me. I think this was a, one of my favorite chapters. Yeah. Um, Sony, you want to talk about 
could you talk about the what we're introduced to in, in argument one is the bummer machine. What does that mean? Yeah, I, I both would like to and can talk about that. Okay, um, Well, first, I really enjoy the acronym. He created the bummer machine. Um, I would like the word bummer probably just a little bit after getting to know you a bit and, and <laughs> coming into closer contact with the word bummer all the time. But Are you talking about that because SoCal Surfer did? Yeah. Yes. But. The term bummer is less um, popular in the Northeast and maybe even Southeast, but it's a term that I think is like the appropriate tone for this book. Um, so basically he introduced this concept of bummer machine or, or bummer platforms. Um, and it stands for behaviors of users modified uh, and made into an empire for rent. And so that may not make total sense, but basically he's talking about these specific platforms that use algorithm, algorithms that are aimed at modifying our behavior. And the business model is um, basically, the business model for these platforms is it's free for us to use, right? And that increases how many people are on it. But the reason why it's free is so that they can create a really large audience to advertise to, um, right? If we're not paying for it, somebody is paying for it. There has to be a business model behind it. Um, and so, to get people on it and to keep people on it, they're using these algorithms um, essentially that are modifying our behavior. And right. so he's he's really trying to narrow the scope of what he's talking about and sort of differentiate between different platforms based on how much they are attempting to modify our behavior, whether that's you know looking at certain advertisements longer or potentially buying things more quickly, you know, like noticing those patterns and and tuning the algorithms to to make us most likely to buy things or engage with material. Yeah, well yeah. said. I think the bummer, um, the bummer uh, algorithm, the bummer machine is a good term for this because I think a lot of times when people are talking about um, technology and the pros and cons of it, it's it's pretty broad and this is very specific, right? So it's, I mean, we can talk about who the, the particular, um, companies are that he's tar targeting, but it's, it is really, it's not like just your smartphone. It's not the internet. It's not technology in general. It is, um, I think there's aspects of this in a lot of different companies, but the, the big ones are Google, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Instagram. Yeah. Which is Facebook. He Anything talks else? about LinkedIn, LinkedIn a little bit. WhatsApp. But, I mean, there's a lot that's yeah, owned by Facebook, but right. yeah. Google, Facebook are the big ones. Right. Yeah. Google, Facebook, and all their so, sort of subsidiaries, so YouTube and all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, and there's a lot of other technology that has like some bummer elements to it as well. Right, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, so that's argument one. You are losing your free will. And then we are introduced to the acronym BUMMER. Argument two, quitting social media is the most finely targeted way to resist the insanity of our times. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's good. Argument three is that social media is making you into an asshole. I like that's my person, one of my personal favorites. It's a good chapter. <laughs> Argument four is social media is undermining truth. Argument five is that social media is making what you say meaningless. Argument six is that social media is destroying your capacity for empathy. And this isn't personal. This is you know all of us using social media. Uh, argument seven is that social media is making you unhappy. Argument eight, social media doesn't want you to have economic dignity. Argument nine, social media is making politics impossible. And argument 10, social media hates your soul. That was also one of my, one of my favorite chapters. Yeah. And so it's, again, instead of doing a play-by-play -play of each of the chapters, we're just going to share some of our biggest takeaways from our experience reading the book. Sure. And I will say that he does a good job. The author does a good job at providing his own personal narratives and really speaking to his experience as well, using these platforms, especially as someone like fully informed of what the platform is trying to accomplish and still sort of the inability to change his behavior or control his behavior in a way that he felt comfortable with. So uh, it's, it really isn't judgy. And I think he does a good job of making these arguments in an unbiased way yeah. as much as possible when you're trying to make an argument, you know? Um, but I'll go into my, do you want to do your takeaways or shall I jump into it? No, jump into it. Okay. So, and then we'll kind of, yeah, we can chat. About yeah. Them as they come up. 
The first one for me is that this idea that if you're not paying for it, you're not the customer, you're the product being sold. And this is something that Sebastian and I have talked about a ton um, and we're aware of. I think though, he really amplified my understanding of this. Um, and one of the things that I had this sort of aha moment of um, remembering in my younger years, going to like nightclubs and bars and stuff and there being covers but only for men not for women women could get I mean, in you free went to nightclubs? i know shocking so, um well, how come i haven't heard okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have gone to some together that's true um, that's true but i just remember the experience of being like you know sort of excited that i didn't have to pay for it but then also eventually sort of being like well wh why don't i have to pay for it why are men paying for it um and trying to articulate to people sort of my question around that or sort of hypothesize what I thought was going on. And I couldn't put my finger on why that was making me uncomfortable um, until, you know, reading this book and it, that memory came back to me and I was thinking, geez, you know, there is this element of, you know, for a nightclub or bar, bar to be popular, um, you know, if you can get a bunch of women in there, potentially you'll attract more men to come in there uh, and spend a bit more money. And, you know, men typically buy women drinks. I know times are changing, but um, yeah. And then, then it was sort of this, ah, that's why that didn't feel great. And starting to contextualize that a little more and, you know, really reaffirming this, like, there's no such thing as a free lunch or really be curious about things that you're not paying for. If it's free, how, how does it exist and who is paying for it? Yeah. Um, and this was a big way that the author was sort of saying, this is how you can identify it, like a potential bummer platform or a piece of the bummer machine. But if you are not paying for it, you know, someone is, you know, and so you are likely not the customer, but the product being sold to the people who are paying for it. Yeah. That was one of the big ones. I think that's a great, it's a great takeaway. And it's, it's a, you know, we've talked about that a lot before. This is all again, under the sort of umbrella of the the term for this is the attention economy, which we've spoke about before and written about. And, mm -hmm. and this is, um, I think he does a really good job of doing a really a more specific and deeper dive into, you know, what that looks like exactly. But mm -hmm. it's a good thing. It's a good, I mean, I think that, yeah, it's like, there's no such thing as a free lunch. That's really accurate, you know? Right. So the, the second big takeaway for me was to really be more curious about these platforms that keep emerging because there really is just like something always new coming out. Um, and if I can't easily discern what the purpose of the platform is, um, for that to be like a little bit of a red flag for me. So when I think about Facebook uh, and when I first got on it, more in its sort of original format and function was to connect you with people in your college and like, you know, almost have a a virtual yearbook that was available to you. Uh, and then it of course evolved. And, and now, you know, you could argue perhaps that there are many purposes to Facebook, but I would more argue that it lacks a purpose. Um, and, you know, probably more importantly than that, of whether they have an actual a defined purpose is, can I identify a purpose that I'm using it, you know, and is it serving me or not, or how am I feeling when I use it? So, the be more curious piece and what's the purpose of this platform was another big takeaway for me. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, and then, what else? okay, the what final else? one is again, sort of this, one of the points he's making, right, is this um, algorithm that's curating content for you based on content you've previously engaged with. So mm -hmm. the things that I find interesting, you know, there's an algorithm behind the scenes creating, uh, you know, or identifying some patterns and showing me more of the things that I, it knows I like, and it knows that I'll engage with more. Um, and again, sort of going back to this memory, I, I may have been with you, I don't remember, but saying like, okay, when you type in this search term, it'll be the third result mm. um, is what you want. And you typed it in, you're like, I can't find it. And I got really frustrated with you. I'm like, it's the third one. And then I went and looked and I was like, oh, your search results are really different than mine. Uh, and I didn't really understand what was happening. And I think, you know, what's happening is evolving over time, but um, the search form feels like it should be a pretty neutral thing for us to be using. And it should be producing the same results for everyone who uses it. Um, but that's clearly not the case. And I think, you know, that was sort of one of the first places I noticed it. And then I think we've all become more aware that, you know, like our social media feeds are showing us specific things that we like. Like once I watch a cat video get like 
you know, every third video is a cat video. Or, you know, once I comment on a post, I start to see more posts like that. Um, and so it's this idea of like, what's next? What's the next thing that's going to be put into an algorithm and curated specifically for me and how problematic that is, um, how you get in your own little echo chamber and it's hard to relate to other people or to even, you're, you basically are living in almost a bubble if that's a primary source of your community and your news in particular. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, I think that's a great, that's a really great point. And I, and may, I mean, maybe that's common knowledge, but I think it is interesting for us to remind ourselves that everyone's Facebook page, everyone's Instagram page is completely different right. and it's unique to you and your individual behaviors. And it's been, it's been, uh, it's, everything is so intentional to right. your, based on your previous behavior um, to try and get you to stay more engaged or each of us as individuals. And this is, this is hugely, I mean, it's problematic for a lot of reasons, but I think uh, it's hugely problematic for politics, which mm -hmm. he gets into in a bit. And um, I think empathy as well. I mean, one of the things that I'm gonna share a little bit more in, in, in my takeaways one of the fascinating things was that the algorithm is um, what do they call it? It's adaptive, right? Right. So it's mm -hmm. it's like it's a sort of a little bit of artificial intelligence here, but it's basically designed to learn and become better. And better in this sense is more engagement, right? So the like long again, the longer we as uh, the user are the longer we're on that particular platform or game or whatever it is, um, the more money they're making. Um, but the big thing for me, the re a really interesting thing for me was that uh, negative emotions are more engaging than positive emotions. And right. so from a, like, just going back to this, if, if you have a, if we all have our particular political stance, we're getting sort of either only seeing, we're seeing a lot of like what we agree with, but then mm -hmm. every once in a while, something that's super inflammatory. That's right. like totally like the far end of the, of the spectrum away from us because they know that people like us with our, with our similar views are getting fired up by this particular post or whatever. And that fear, that anger is, is uh, super engaging. And so it promotes that. And it's, but it's not an actual discourse it's not like an actual conversation it's just mm -hmm. like uh something that's so out there that it's going to make you freak out whether you're a republican or democrat conservative whatever it's really kind of a fascinating thing so yeah when it, it brings you more to you know one side of the spectrum and then pushes you even for at the same time pushes you further away from the other side of the spectrum because it's it's really taking the polar pieces and like negating all the middle ground right um yeah, the empathy piece was really powerful to me too. And, uh, and you feel it, right? Like it's becoming harder and harder where you hear somebody say like, oh, I'm, you know, pro this or anti this. Um, if, you know, whatever your stance is not it's, I feel myself being like, what? How could they do that way? Yeah. Like based on all the information I've been seeing, it's like so clearly the wrong stance. Uh, and they think the same thing about me. Um, and that it has a lot to do with these algorithms that are happening behind the scenes for sure. Yeah. So yeah, consequence of that is that yeah, it like polarizes people and, and there's less like middle, there's less like people in the middle, I think. Right. You get, and yeah. we're not talking. I mean, I'm only talking right. to the people that agree with me generally. Right. Yeah. 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 It's okay. bonkers. Um, okay. Should I highlight some of the uh, Yeah, well that was highlight. one of your takeaways. Oh, that was one of my takeaways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think, you know, like stepping back a little bit, a big um we've spoken about this a little bit, but just the book highlighted like how problematic the current business model of social media is or the bummer thing like just the the, the general model mm -hmm. isn't good and that's his big argument for like kind of the only way to get the social media to change or these big you know facebook googles to change is to to delete and then you know it offers uh, there's an opportunity to to adjust this or come out with a different platform or a different mm -hmm. business model mm -hmm. but really um the business model incentivizes finding customers, advertisers, to pay in order to modify someone else's behavior. That's kind of bananas. Yeah. And um, I think like, so it's, the whole thing is run like 
we've already talked about this a little bit, but just like people are paying to modify our behaviors and it's pretty nuts. Mm -hmm. And um, I think he gets into this as well, that never in our history have we had such a, uh, we're in a, a unique time where we've never had such a large scale behavior modification machine, mm -hmm. meaning our smartphones. And the smartphones are not the problem, but it's basically, we're all carrying around these devices that are, that are really highly suitable for mass behavior modification. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's mm -hmm. like, you know, alarming to me. Right. And I thought one of the interesting things that he brought up with the sort of example he chose to use was it's, it's um, back in the day when paint had a lot of lead in it, it wasn't, it wasn't that paint was bad and that nobody should paint anything anymore. It was just that people stopped buying paint because the lead levels were too high. And then by stop buying that paint, um, it sort of forced the industry to shift and create right. paint that didn't have lead. So again, like the smartphone is the paint in this particular um, analogy. Uh, and it's not about throwing away your smartphone. It's just like about really perhaps questioning, you know, what's in the smartphone, like what's being used. It could be a really useful tool uh, if we clean it up a little bit. Right. And I think he sort of offered it also the idea that like, you know, one solution could be like, oh, we all pay a little bit to use Facebook. Right. Um, and then we've changed that business model so that they don't have to go to advertisers. And I thought he did, again, sort of a nice job in presenting sort of neutral argument of like, this all sort of started in a really noble place of wanting technology to be free and open access. Um, but, you know, then how, <laughs> what business model exists around that? And so then to allow it to be free to people, you know, they had to create a business model that made some money and then, you know, the people become the right. product instead of the customer. And yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah. It's, um, I think I already spoke to my, my next big takeaway, which is basically that again, uh, the algorithm is right. Um, it basically pushes negative emotions over positive emotions. And because negative emotions engage us more than positive ones. Mm -hmm. I think this is sort of an interesting kind of couple of quotes that I wrote down from the book. And it's, it's like, right, he writes that there is no evil genius sitting seated in a cubicle in a social media company performing calculations and deciding that making people feel bad is more engaging and therefore more profitable than making them feel good. So it's not, it's not like it's intentional. It's just like the algorithm is doing whatever it can to become more engaging. It doesn't really care about the cost with it. Let's our individual anger or fear. Uh, but he goes on to say that engagement is not meant to serve any particular purpose other than its own enhancement. And yet the result is an unnatural global amp amplification of the easy emotions, which happen to be the negative ones. Mm -hmm. It's pretty, yeah, I think that's, I mean, when you spend some time on social media, on Facebook, and I think for me in particular, it is, this is helpful to recognize that like, it uh, it is highly negative mm -hmm. and there's a reason for that, you know? Right. And it's changing the way we interact with other platforms too. Like I've even noticed some news outlets, you know, changing the way they're creating headlines to be a more inflammatory so that it's more likely that I click on it, even if it's not really accurately representing the article. Um, so it's, yeah, it's this, um, Right. It's a machine, not a human. It's optimizing itself. Um, and it's doing that without human emotions or um, or like human ethics even really, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that was also one of the really interesting things that the, obviously the people, the engineers, the computer scientists, the programmers making these algorithms, um, right? They obviously know what's going on to a certain extent, but they don't know, they're not like monitoring this 24 mm seven. -hmm. and. Uh, I think this this kind of falls into there's a lot of dangerous stuff that can happen when people aren't really aware of what's going on, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. And this is one of my kind of falls into one of my final takeaways is that, and this is one of his arguments that social media gets in the way of our free will. Yeah. And I think that's really huge for me as a, you know, as a I'm not like a heavy user, but I'm in the mix, and I think this was helpful for me to to. You know, it's so, I think it's so hard to see this when you're using it because it's so sneaky, right? right? And I think this was a, just a great reminder for me to step back and 
really take more control of my life and my decisions. Um, because I think we are, as we, you know, as you will find out if you take a dive into this book, that even if we don't feel like we're being manipulated, we are all being manipulated by uh, the algorithm. Right. Yeah. To to use the platform is to be manipulated. Right. Manipulated. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. a function of the machine. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Okay. Challenges? Yeah. Let's get into the challenge. Um, yeah. Okay. So, as you know, or you may know, that we like to do a challenge to our listeners uh, based on the topic we're talking about. And so, uh, the, the challenge is this, it's more of a question, you know? So what changes can you make to your social media use right now based on what we talked about? And here are a few examples. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe it's deleting all of your social media accounts. Um, or perhaps it's deleting a few that you don't use, uh, maybe focusing on one. Perhaps it's deactivating before you're deleting some of these, you know, like I think Facebook and Instagram, you can you can deactivate. It's like a kind of a temporary oh, pause. Like a pause. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Another option is uh, you can take the apps off your phone and only use them on a computer. Or if you're using them on your phone, just using them through like a web browser like Safari or Chrome. Right. That's a, a better way. I think the the apps are much better at doing all these things than the platforms are just on a web browser. Mm -hmm. Um Another one is turning off notifications on the apps if you happen to leave them on your phone. So the challenge is more of a question. It's just what changes can you make to your social media use right now? Hmm. I love it. I love it. And we'd love to hear what you what you decide to do. And how it impacts you, yeah. if it does. Um, does it drive you crazy? Does it make you feel better? What's the experience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you know what time it is? Oh my gosh. Wait, it's... is it your turn for a jingle? No. Let's do that. No, no, no. let's do that. Uh, you know what time it is? It's time for new news. And Seb has a little jingle wow. for you. New news, new news. It's time for new news. Love it. Did you like that? I did like it. Okay. All right. So this is very on point with what we've been talking about. And the um, the article, actually, can you pull it up? Can you pull it up? Let's do it. The article is titled Instagram for Kids. So I'm not Santa, gonna pull it up, but I okay. can tell you about it. We can, no, we can talk about it. Yeah. We can talk about it. We don't need to pull it up. It's super in line with this, what we're talking about. Uh, you may have heard of this, maybe not, but this is recent. Um, CNN did a story on this. And basically that Facebook is coming up with a um, Instagram platform specifically for kids. And there's, a, I guess, been a huge amount of backlash from uh you know, from mental health advocates, from parents, from teachers, from all these people who are like, this is a bad idea, Facebook. <laughs> um, but Facebook's like, no, 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 it's going to be okay. Well, right. And I think the Facebook slash Instagram stance on this is where right, they have the age restriction. You know, those platforms are meant, I don't know what it is actually. Is it 13 or 14? 13, I think. Yeah. So you're not supposed to use it or be able to create an account if you're under the age of 13. Um, but kids are doing that anyway, right? It's not a foolproof system and kids are on there. And so their argument is that kids are on there, they're using this, let's create a space that's just for kids so that we can protect them a little more. So they're not interacting with adults um, and getting into weird situations or conversations, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, it seems potentially like a, a noble thought um but yeah it doesn't seem to be getting at the root problem of just maybe kids under 13 shouldn't be on this and we need to figure out how to to not have them on it versus well they're already on it so let's just create a safe place for it yeah know? and I, I think i think that's that's a great point is that even even if this was was safer the whole as you know as you and i just learned i mean and we kind of know but the whole platform is based on advertising right and even if it's a little bit safer from potentially like bots or uh bad characters out there but mm -hmm. you know adults pretending to be kids for creepy reasons <laughs> or whatever um it's still going to be run by uh app through advertising like run through uh and like powered by advertising dollars which is a concern mm -hmm. um i think there was a quote in there from someone who's against this that, that you know that uh the best Instagram for kids is no Instagram for kids. Basically, <laughs> I like that statement. Yeah. I think that's true. I agree with that personally. 
Uh, yeah, but it's probably gonna it's probably gonna happen regardless of this uh, backlash. So we will we will keep you posted on Instagram for kids and how uh, that unfolds. So right, should- and I, th- though I think the for the parents who happen to listen to this or adults who have kids in their lives, whether they're aunts or uncles or grandparents, etc. Um, the point here is that you have a choice on whether your kids get to use for a while, at least your kids get to use um, the social media platforms. And, you know, if you think about it in terms of their mental health wellness, uh, it's the same thing as, you know, you don't want to just have candy all around the house or these other, or her, you know, alcohol, or you know, all these substances, uh, in some ways, social media could be considered a substance for mental health and wellness. Um, so there's sure. a choice involved in this too. So um, to not just feel powerless because a new platform has emerged that your kids want. Right. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Well said. Well, any final words? No, I think, I, I hope people are excited to read this book. We yeah. really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. It sort of freaked me out, but in a, in a, in a, good, in a way. good way, learning way. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was super helpful. We highly recommend it. Check it out. It's 10 arguments for deleting your social media accounts right now by Jerome Lanier. So that'll do it. Thanks so much for listening to and tuning into this episode of the Nature Unplugged podcast. You can find our episodes on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify, basically any of the podcast platforms. And we're now even on YouTube in video form. Wow. Uh, We would love it if you could take a moment to rate and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts. It helps us a ton. Be sure and visit www.natureunplugged.com for more information about our services, about our educational workshops, our digital detox retreats, all of our things. You can also find a whole bunch more uh, free resources like this podcast on our website. Um, Yeah. Thanks so much for listening. And until next time, remember to experience nature. Bye everybody. Bye. Things change like seasons out of our control. If you think you should go, I will let you go.